I thought we were the protectors of truth. Democrats, Republicans, you all lie. We, a small band of survivors, are on our way to the Steel City to find the resistance. Join us. Welcome to the Steel City Resistance with Senior Airman Ward Miller and the ironclad voice of Pittsburgh Hutch Jr. laying down verbal C4 to blow away the lies and the political tomfoolery. Your papers have been cleared. Welcome to the Steel City Resistance. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Steel City Resistance. My name is Hudson Jr., and I am located deep, deep down in the bunker, and I'd like to take this opportunity once again to thank Mr. Byer Brown for an outstanding introduction. You got that right, and I'm Ward Miller, also in the city of Pittsburgh here in Mission Control, and yeah, Byer really hooked us up with that one, and, uh, and we've been using it to, the, it to the fullest of its abilities. Absolutely. It's... Uh... It just fits the show. I mean, it, it's uh, I like hearing it every every week. I do. Uh, we got a lot going on, Ward, uh, as usual. But it, it seems like uh, it's it's packed a little full today. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff that went on this week, and uh, I, I mean, tons of stuff for us to talk about. Um, so uh, we might want to jump in real quick because we got so much, you know. <laughs> As they said in Smokey and the Bandit, we got a long way to go and a short time to get there. Absolutely. And there's uh, there's been some talk uh, lately, and I've heard some of it rebuked. Is that a word? Rebuked? Yes. I've, I've heard some of it. Uh, uh, a former Navy SEAL uh, kind of said that this was just business as usual, and it just didn't get reported before. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, stories out there about massive ammunition procurements by different uh different agencies in the u.s government and uh you know it always makes me look back at, the way he explained it was that this is just range requirements and i'm thinking even the federal government doesn't use hollow point ammunition on a range i mean they use ball ammunition on the range i've been on thousands of ranges and and uh they're stockpiling all this ammunition and then you think back uh, to 2008 uh obama's statements on uh, creating uh, a large national security civilian security force as large and as well-funded as the U.S. military. And you look at all these small arms ammunition, or uh, sidearm, actually, ammunition purchases, and that uh, that gives a little bit of fuel to conspiracy, conspiracy people out there. I mean, it makes well, me nervous, too. Well, I mean, when you consider that one of the biggest ones buying all the ammunition is Homeland Security. Yeah. Um, and the IRS, you know, the IRS, the Social Security Administration. Yeah, I don't understand why, you know, that makes absolutely no sense why those Homeland Security, I can almost see it. Um, but but you would think they would purchase the right. IRS, what the hell does the IRS need with ammunition for? You would think that Homeland Security would purchase rifle ammunition, though. You yeah. Know, all this all this handgun am ammunition. That's like, are they planning on coming to the house? You know, it's, uh, I don't know, it's just, uh, and then like I said, the guy said that this happens all the time, and it's nothing to get worried about, that they've been doing this forever, it just never got reported before, but a, pre a president has never said he wants a, a huge, basically so, a brown shirt, an SA apparatus, you know, for uh, civilians, I mean, it's just bizarre, man, it, there's a lot of bizarre stuff that's, that's going to be on this show to, this week, I mean. Yeah, I mean, well, the whole thing is, I mean, you, you think about it. Why does the president need a security force other than the U.S. military? The U.S. military is the most powerful military on the planet. Right. He's got the FBI and he's got all these different, the, there's 10 or 11 different police forces. The only thing that I can think of is because the U.S. military may not um, do his bidding, you know, with the posse comitatus and just say, no, we aren't going to do that. And, I mean, he's and getting, so he's, if, if he decides he wants to do something at a state level, he can't impose the uh, the U.S. military on a state. And the state's military is, is controlled by the governor of that state. So, well. They did. They did. Uh, 
tweak it, though, I will say, uh, the National Defense Authorization Act of 2012 changed the uh, ability of the federal government to utilize at least the reserve forces. I'm not sure about active duty, but uh, for natural disasters. So it's not uh, law enforcement, which is what uh, Posse Comitatus, that's what that covers, but... Uh, well, that was the thing, and that's one of the things that that hurt um, hurt us going into um, New Orleans. Exactly, right? exactly. Because the governor said we don't want your help, and Bush couldn't force the military in to aid them because the governor refused to re refused the uh, the aid. And, and here's here's something that, that nobody's talking about. You, you're not going to hear it in the mill, you know, in the uh, you know on the in the media. You know, sh surely none of the big four, the talking heads, are going to say anything about it. But here's a question: When all that stuff happened in Louisiana, and you know, Kanye West goes on the news and says George Bush hates black people, and that's why he didn't help down there. It took Bush two weeks to get into uh, Louisiana. I mean, even with all the devastation and whatnot, because the governor wouldn't let them in. It's been over two months since Sandy hit in New York, in New Jersey, and yet there's no anything being done. They're, they're, you know, they're not commenting it on the news, but these people are out there. They still don't have power from four freaking months ago and they just got hit by another storm and they just got hit by the mo one of the most ridiculous storms i've seen uh, that i can remember i mean they're, they're talking about they had dumps of four feet of snow yeah something. It was, they, they were getting like six inches of snow an hour that and, and for for those that are listening that aren't from a, a, a place you know that, that it snows <laughs> all the time six inches of snow an hour is a hell of a lot of snow yeah that's uh, that's record breaking for sure a couple things on the uh, uh, Bush's Katrina response. Uh, I recently finished uh, Bush's memoirs, and he said that when Kanye West said that, when he was when he was saying what the worst part of his presidency was, he said that hit him in the, in the stomach when he said that. He said they had meetings on on board of Air Force One, where he was trying to convince Governor uh, I forget her name now, Lamb yeah. whatever her name was. He was trying to convince her. You know that you got to look out for your people. I mean, it was like, let me help you, and she continued to refuse. And he said he was almost at the point of doing it anyway. But he, unlike our current administration, he had such respect for the Constitution that he didn't. And I don't know. I mean, for for a situation like that that doesn't really involve uh, federal control of you know local jurisdictions, he maybe he should have. Well, here's the thing. Why? I mean, New Jersey's still having problems. Yeah. I mean, there's there's tons of people in New Jersey that still don't have power. That still, you know, their house is still all tore up. FEMA has done absolutely nothing. Uh, even though the president, you know, right before the election, went there and, and and swore on Chris Christie that he would have, you know, he'd cut through all the red tape and they'd be ready to go. And here it is, you know, f what is it? Two months later. Yeah, it's almost three months later and and the and the president still has yet you know to to wrap up anything there and he made a you hell know, of a political photo op when he when he went up there and oh absolutely and, and he, christy he defected all, <laughs> yeah and, and christy you know slobbered all over him and, and you know got all weepy when he got him on the phone with bruce springsteen and i mean it it, it was just a big kumbaya moment but all that, a lie 100 percent a lie too Oh yeah, you know? and it's yeah, and it's still a lie. And and the fact, you know, Christie is is nothing more than a wolf in sheep's clothing. He is not a Republican by any stretch of the imagination. I fell victim to it, so and I'll be I. the first one to admit to it. I I honestly believe that that he was a a, a good you know straight upstanding Republican. And he went out of his way to prove me wrong. Yeah, he did on several fronts. I mean, he's uh, installed Muslim Brotherhood people in in the in the judiciary and other places in New Jersey. He's a big uh, big rhino, man. I'm telling you. Well, well, and not only that. I mean, he, he was just on uh, Letterman, and you could t that's how you can tell. 
is because if he was a, a Republican, you watch somebody who is very right leaning go on Letterman and Letterman attacks him like O'Reilly. Bill O'Reilly goes on for whatever reason. And, and, and Letterman is actually aggressive towards him. But yet when Christie was on, it was this big, Powder you puff. know, it, it was a big love fest. Oh, it was yeah. ridiculous. It sick me. Now, something happened this week. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that was stunning to me, uh, and it got virtually no coverage, other than Fox News and on the in new media. Uh, but they were interviewing Panetta and uh, General Dempsey on Benghazi, and both of those guys blew me away. They both admitted that they pushed, and Hillary Clinton pushed, the gun running operation from Libya to Syria. And that's, uh, I mean, if you remember Iran-Contra, there's precedent for when this kind of thing happens. And, I mean, we're going to talk about it later on in the program, but uh, it's just uh, stunning to me that that this uh, is now coming out in the open. And there's, there's basically been a concerted effort in Washington in the administration to separate and sever Obama from these operations. I mean, they said it in a couple different ways, uh, but one of the ways was Obama had no contact with either one of the one, one contact with both of those guys throughout the entire Benghazi operation. To me, that's, that's a, that's a cover up. That's, that's insulating him. There's no way in the world that's possible. I mean, well, I mean, it's the same as Fast and Furious, right? Exactly. You know, the thing is, they said that the president has absolutely no knowledge of what happened with Fast and Furious, yet when Congress tries to subpoena the records, he pl he claims executive privilege. Now, that's, in my opinion, having your cake and eating it, too. It's, you know, I have absolutely nothing to do with what happened with Fast and Furious. I don't know anything about it. Well, we want to see the paperwork. Well, you can't. That's That's... You know, executive privilege. He can't claim executive privilege if he'd never seen, if he didn't know anything about the documents or about the operation. You know, and it, if he doesn't know anything about them, then he's just as incompetent as they get. And and I honestly do not believe that President Obama is incompetent. I believe that everything he does is calculated. Oh, but yeah, without a doubt. Now, now you got to understand. When I say why I was stunned about the gun running, ladies and gentlemen, the United States of America has provided weaponry to the Muslim Brotherhood. That's it in a nutshell. I said it from the beginning. John McCain wanted to get out there and arm these guys. He wanted to arm them from the beginning, and I was like, hold on. Didn't we learn anything in Egypt? Let's stand by here and see who in the hell we're arming first. And then it started becoming clear and you can you can look at uh, uh, documented uh, reporting from Syria that uh, the villagers are saying that hey, these people that are against Assad, and this is not in any way, shape, or form a uh, an approval of that asshole. But when when you have bad on both sides, do you really want to arm them? And, and McCain's saying, yeah, we got to arm these guys. No fly zones, everything else. Half of those people that are in the resistance aren't even Syrian. They're coming. No, they're not. They're coming. Most in, of them are Al Qaeda. They're all, yeah, and they're coming in from other countries. And this is nothing more than the uh, growth of the caliphate. That's what it is. And there's sometimes when the United States should just stay the hell out of it. I mean, what are you going to do? You know, you can't arm Assad. Has killed sixty thousand of his own people, and you got the Muslim Brotherhood and Al Qaeda on the other side. Well, I think it's more Al Qaeda than than the Muslim Brotherhood uh, in Syria. Now, but remember, the, remember the, back oh, in the yeah, shows, they're, they're, they're all the you Muslim know, Brotherhood they're, created Al Qaeda. Yeah, they're all, you know, it, it's just which iterate. I mean, it, it, it's like here, right? You have Care who says that they're, you know, they're they're, all they're, right they're hand holding Muslim chubby bastards, <laughs> and then you got them where they go want to go out and you know. In the background, they're saying that they want to kill us and, and destroy our economy and destroy the United States. And, and that's just the way that, that it is. And 
The fact yeah. that we gave F-16s and we gave Abrams A-1 tanks to the Muslim Brotherhood and, and that this administration believes, you know, I, I can't believe that they actually would come out and say, yeah, we, we don't think Morosi is a bad guy. And we think that, you know, everything is going to turn out, you know, rainbows and, and unicorns. Is, you know, everything's going to be great in Egypt and this, that, and the other thing. Unreal. You just gave them hardcore weaponry. And it, this, this is the same guy who went into the media and said that the Holocaust didn't happen. Absolutely. I mean, Prime Minister Erdogan from Turkey said it best. Uh, we're, we're just playing games with all these different factions and all these different groups. And there's no moderate Islam and radical Islam. There is only Islam. He said it right. And until we get that, until we realize uh, that they've been doing this for 1,700 years and nothing's changed. Uh, and I've said it time and time again because we got to get over this. we got to quit, quit acting like... These these seventh century people, and that's being nice to them, are looking at things the same way we are. You know, they're looking at maps the way we are. They're not. They're different than we are, and they're about worldwide domination. And that's it's in their it's in their playbook. I mean, it's, yeah, it's it just in their is. DNA. Well, I, and we don't have any of this in the notes, but uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw you another curve, hot show, enjoy. No problem. Um, uh, we posted a thing on, on the Facebook page with uh, Dr. Ben Carson, who spoke at the, uh, the prayer breakfast. And he said something that, I mean, his speech was, was outstanding. And if you get a chance, go to our website and, and check it out. We have the, uh, the entire speech up there. He, he, he was very well-spoken, and he... Uh, you know, there was a lot of people that after he got done speaking, uh, immediately said he should be the next guy that the Republicans run for run as pre you know for president. I'm waiting to and, hear the left. I'm waiting to hear the left call him an Uncle Tom. That's next. Oh yeah, but the the thing is, I, I think that the Republican Party right now is so they're scared. And, and, and sconced in, in crap. That's stupid shit. You're right. That, 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 that they, you know, anybody that, that looks like they might have a fresh idea, they want to, you know, they, they just gravitate to. And, and not saying that Carson had bad ideas. They, they, they were all very good ideas. Um, he was very well spoken. And one of the things is the same thing that we've been saying on this show forever. I mean, basically, since show number one is political correctness is going to kill us. It's an absolute and, attack on your First Amendment rights. And it, exactly. it, it stifles conversation, and it's, it, it's a tactic. It, it's a tactic that was instituted by our enemies in the Soviet Union. It was. And, and it worked. And they, and, and they learned how to work it. And, and that's the same thing. And, and that's what Carson said. And like I said, and, and what impressed me was the fact that he went off about budget he went off in, in a respectful way five he feet did. away from the oh, president yeah. of the united states it was and we have a might as well scroll down there's a story on this in the show notes oh i i didn't realize that's we all right. we're, work, we're working it we're working it might as well just go into it all i right. mean this guy was awesome he was articulate he was soft-spoken and he was dead serious and he mentioned a couple different a couple different things, primarily what you said, Ward, about the political correctness being ridiculous. Uh, and you could just see President Obama's face, and I would have loved to have been in his thought process because he just got excoriated without a one mean word being said. Oh, absolutely. I mean, he sat hey, there absolutely. and he, he, he grabbed the Bible, and Tchaikovsky, the, the senator, or I don't know if she's a senator or a uh, representative but she was on one of the sunday shows and couldn't believe that this man used the bible and religion because basically what he said he was pushing a fair tax a flat tax uh by christianity's tithing uh process where you everybody gives 10 percent, and he said you don't have to be 10 percent, but everybody ought to if he said if a billionaire is up there made 10 billion dollars he puts a billion dollars in the pot the guy that makes ten dollars puts one dollar in the pot, but why can we do that when, when there's no way to hurt this guy, this this rich guy? 
And he's like, why would you hurt the rich guy? He just put a billion dollars in the pot. Well, yeah, that's the question. And that's the same thing we've been saying all along. Absolutely. Why do you have to, why do, do, do these people feel as though it's necessary to punish somebody that's successful? Exactly. It's, I broke my ass to, to invent this widget, whatever. And, you know, I, I'm more than happy to pay my fair share. But when my fair share is, well, let's see how much we can make them make him pay before he actually wants to just leave the country. I'll tell you, my wife and I were watching TV last night. And we were, they were showing some uh, different tax rates and different things like that. And I looked at her and I said, if you were rich, why would you live here? I mean, Jesus, I, they, they're coming back for more. Nancy well, Pelosi was on TV today talking about we need more taxes on the rich. And I'm thinking they're going to be They're going to leave. Yeah. Absolutely. And you you look at, uh, who was it? Wasn't the golfer? Phil, was it Phil Mickelson? Yeah, the one that moved out of, out of California. Yeah. He said, why would I live here? He look said, what Rush Limbaugh did. Rush Limbaugh got the hell out of it, and so did Glenn Beck. Got out, they started making money, and they're like, I'm out of New York. Oh, yeah. Go go to where, Rush you know, to, go to Texas. Yeah. In fact, I think, isn't that where Beck is now? Beck went to Texas? Texas, and Rush went to Florida. Yeah, you know, and they're, they're much not better gonna, off. They're not going to fight with the taxes. And New York is still, New York still uh, audits his taxes. You know, thinking they might have missed a dollar or something. It's disgusting. It is now. Uh, I don't have this guy's name. I, I, you might have to help me out here. But out in L.A., there's this ex-cop out there, an ex-military, uh, that whacked three people. He, he thought he had a. Uh, it, it seems to me. Uh, without knowing all the facts, but just being on the sidelines and uh, listening and ha having been through some of this before, that he had an axe to grind before he even got the job. I mean, he was an L.A. cop. Now, now this guy, who Warren's going to tell me his name in a second, as soon as I finish yeah. this. Well, his name's Christopher Dormer. Dormer. Yeah. D-O-R-N-E-R, -E Dormer. And he is a, an avid leftist and a huge admirer of Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama and Piers Morgan and all the all the lefties, Charlie Sheen. Yeah, and he's on the run. They were on him like like white on rice at the beginning, but this guy had a plan because he's claiming it's all about what happened on the LAPD when they relieved him, uh, and he was only on the force for a very short time. I mean, he was relieved while he was on probation, I believe, but he uh, that was four years ago. So the guy's got a plan. He was a military. He was an officer in the Navy. Uh, so. They haven't found him. They, they, they lost his trail. Yeah, the trail went cold. Um, and, in fact, if you go on our Facebook page, we have a link to uh, his manifesto. Yeah, he wrote this 20-page manifesto that, like, uh, just went – I didn't read it, but uh, – No, but, I mean, basically – If it was on the East Coast, I might have. Well, the, the thing is, everything that he has on there, he's, you know, basically – uh, you know, if, if somebody is on the left and, and you know, he, he says that, you know, the gun grabbing is a good idea. Oh, yeah. You know, he, he's, he's a big time lefty himself. Like all, like all most, uh, serial killers are. And yet the, the media is trying to portray him as just this rogue cop who went, yeah. you know, no, it's not. It, it's a, it's a lefty whack job yep. who went out and decided he's going to start killing people. And one of them was an LAPD officer yeah. that, that he killed. Going after their families, too. I mean, he killed uh, a family member of somebody that was involved in his case. But anyway, we're going to have to pay attention to that. Uh, he's going to have to live underground the rest of his life. I mean, he's highly identifiable. He's like 250. Uh, and his picture's been all over everything. So we'll have to keep an eye on that. Uh, in the meantime, the New England really got snowed on. It seems like they're dealing with it much better uh, than the leftist bastion of New York City did, though. I mean, they, you, you don't hear as much. Uh, there's like four deaths or something like that. And they got, I mean, they got triple the amount of snow. Uh, so we're just going to have to, our hearts go out to you out in the New England area. I'm sure a lot of you are much more self-sufficient. And maybe we won't be hearing cries for $60 billion of tax money to bail your ass out. Uh, but we'll see what happens. Oh, well, th th there was some of the stuff that I saw, um, or you know, just from the weight of the snow, from four feet of snow yeah. on top of the roofs, were just collapsing houses. But the thing about it is, you know, and the used thing is, it. a lot of those houses too were already. I mean, not not New England. We're not going to talk about New England, but in New Jersey, New Jersey got two feet of snow, and and some of them structures just, you know, from Sandy, you know, the fact that. 
that uh, they weren't repaired after Sandy, they're taking a huge hit, you know, with his one-two punch. Well, it's not a one-two punch. It's a one punch and then waits two, two and a half months and then hit again. But now the thing is, know. is that like when you get into a, when you get into a northeastern, damn near total Democrat city area with a lot of people in it, you have a lot of entitlement mentality. And a lot of those oh, yeah. people uh, will sit there and wait for a roof to cave in. You know, like where an industrious person that doesn't feel entitled to anything other than life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, his ass is up on the roof with a shovel. You know, and that's, exactly. that's just a fact. Of, that's just a fact because, I mean, I've been on the roof with a shovel and other people's houses were caving in. You know, you got to take care of yourself. It's like this whole Second Amendment thing. You know, if you if you count on the cops to be your sole protection, you're dumb as hell. I'm just saying, you are. You're in charge of your own protection. They'll come document it. Well, now here's the question that every the, the argument that I make with everybody who who you know wants to be a, a gun grabber, or, you know, whatever you want to call them, and the the. The thing they always say to me is, well, you can call the police and the police can get here in time. And I said, okay. If they want now, to. Now, no, here, here's, here, here's the argument you give them. Do you have a fire extinguisher? Well, yeah. Why do you have a fire extinguisher? You, you're counting on the fire department to get here. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's the same thing. It is. It's absolutely the same thing. It's, well, I have the fire extinguisher, so I can do something about it. And, you know, before the fire department gets here. Yeah, maybe we won't have to call the fire department. Uh, well, let me yeah. tell you something. Somebody b breaks into my house, there's going to be a call to the police department one way or another. To come get um, this body. <laughs> yeah, because there's going to there's gonna be a, well, we won't get. It's like, the guy said, it's like the guy said when he was testifying in front of Congress. He said, I'm going to call 911 right after I secure my home. Right after I secure the perimeter and take care of any threats inside, that's when I'll call 911. You know? Exactly. Uh, now this this next uh, situation, and we're gonna we're going real deep here, but what are you gonna do? Uh, I could never understand when honest I don't know about honest when intelligent people that live in a city that's broke, like Chicago, when the police are asking, and it's not the police, it's the police unions, are asking for a 12 percent raise. Knowing the condition that Illinois is in, uh, about ready to just get sucked down the bankruptcy drain hole, and they're asking for 12 percent. I mean, what do they never stop? They are so greedy, they never stop. Well, you know, and here's it's not the just thing. them either. I mean, the federal government, <laughs> the, the the union head of the federal government says that the raise that they're going to give the federal force is not enough. He said the same thing. So, are you people blind? Shut up. Well, here's the problem. You know, they're going to turn around and point to all the murders. And they say, you know what? We we had, you know, 500 murders in, in, in Chicago last year, and it's because, you know, we don't have enough police officers on the streets, and we don't have enough police officers, and we don't pay police officers enough. And we, you know, and, and it's the same same ploy that you just saw Obama do when he drug little kids onto the stage with him to sign gun, you know, Gun legislation. Yeah, and Nancy it's Pelosi's doing it. Thing. She's doing it for the State of the Union too. She's bringing in, bringing oh, in. Course, I'm sure she is. It's disgusting. All the, the kids from all the the parents from Sandy Hook ought to be ashamed of themselves yeah. for letting them, letting these people use their children as props. Absolutely. You know, it, it's ridiculous. Human you know, shields. Well, I, I the thing is, I just saw one of the parents from Sandy Hook testifying in front of Congress. And he was literate. I mean, he he was direct to the point and said, no, you know, my son was killed. But that doesn't mean I want you to take away all the guns in the planet. Yeah, there's I been mean, some good positive arguments by parents. And these are the Sandy Hook parents. They're just, and, they're just not but, on NBC. You'll never see them on NBC. You'll see them on I our mean, site. And you'll see them on our Facebook page, though. And you may see them on C-SPAN or something <laughs> like that if you, you know, watch that, which I do. Um uh, but that, that's where I've seen them. And the, the fact is, that, you know, the, the parents in, in, in Sandy Hook, you know, that, that lost children, I, I, I feel so sorry for you. So I really I. do. And, and the kids that made it through it, why are you forcing your child to relive that? 
God bless Why the ones you, that you are. Know, that, that you built them another school that looks similar to their old school. You moved them away from that school. Oh, did they? Yes, they did. And, and, and that's great. And, yeah. and I totally agree with that. I mean, because the kids, you know, you got to get his head straight. But the problem is, you know, you did all this stuff to help insulate them from the fact that, you know, they're not going to school on a killing ground anymore. But at the same time, you're subjecting them to Nancy Pelosi. And you're subjecting them to Barack Obama. Why would you do that? Who, who, I mean, who are holding them up as, look at these poor victims that made it through. Why would you do that to yeah, your kid? It's, it's disgusting. It really is. It's almost, well, it's actually more disgusting. But in Ohio, there's been a little bit of a capitulation here. John Kasich, who I used to hold in really high regard, has totally drunk the Kool-Aid. And he's starting to talk about raising all kinds of taxes in Ohio. And he's setting everything up for Obamacare. John Kasich, shame on you. Uh, you're on the watch list, buddy. It's bad. Yeah, it's, it, it's just a matter of time. You know, I mean, the the fact is, you got a bunch of states already that said that, that we're not going to do it. Pennsylvania is um, one of them. Huh? Pennsylvania is one of them. And Pennsylvania is one of them. I want to see what happens. You know, when all these mandates start coming due, if if Corbett's going to actually, you know, toe the line and say no, we said we're not going to do this and we're not going to do it. He said so so far, but we'll see. It's another yep. it's another one we're going to be watching. Now, ladies and gentlemen, from the email, uh, there's a. A group that were on their email list called the United West, and it's run by Tom Trento, and he comes up with some breaking, breaking news all the time. I mean, he's if you saw the films uh, that show uh, a group of people in Dearbornistan and Dearborn, Michigan, uh, trying to you know have free speech and getting things thrown at them and stuff. That's his group. Uh, he's very confrontational. He's down in Florida, uh, but he sent an email, breaking news email out. CIA, John Brennan, is a Muslim. And I totally believe it because he's got it all documented. And you can watch the powerful expose. You do not have to tell me that this whole subject sounds like a very bad, low-budget Hollywood movie, but this is the Obama world we now occupy. And, I mean, he uh, as this story races its way across America, get ready for some insanity from the organized left as they attack the messengers instead of investigating the message. Uh, I mean, this is serious, serious business. And, and I, I mean, I've heard him say things. They're saying that when he was in uh, Saudi Arabia is when he converted. Um, Brennan has served his country with honor and dignity, especially in Saudi Arabia and Al-Quds. Big deal. So the head of the CIA is a Muslim. Who cares? We care because Islam, by definition, is both a religion and a political system. Moreover, by doctrine, full allegiance to the political mandate of Islam, world domination supersedes allegiance to anything else, including the United States of America. Uh, so that's just uh, something that was kind of uh, mandatory to bring on the program, Ward. I mean, that, I can't stand that guy. John Brennan, I've heard him. He calls Jerusalem al Quds. I mean, he doesn't even call it by the, the name that the Israelis refer to it as. And I might have had those details slightly messed up, Joshua. You can hook me up if I'm wrong. But he did call an Israeli city by the name that the Muslims go by, use for it. Well, I have some breaking news then, too. Because today, Lindsey Graham sent a note to the White House that said, The White House is stonewalling on Benghazi means no information, no confirmation. The, Good. He said that he will not allow uh, neither Hegel or Brennan to be uh, to be confirmed until they get all the facts on Benghazi. Oh, I hope they have the, the power to do that because Lindsey Graham has actually been showing some balls lately, and that's, uh, that's different for him. I mean, he's not normal. Uh, that's usually different for him. Yeah, that's not normal behavior, so it must be serious. I mean... Uh, we'll see what happens. Ladies and gentlemen, your weekly Jihad report from February 2nd to February 8th. 39 Jihad attacks, 5 al Akbars, 303 dead bodies, 400 suicide attacks. The religion of peace, ladies and gentlemen, one body at a time. I think you meant to say 400 critically injured. I did. What did I say? You said 400 suicide attacks. I Stand corrected. 400 critically injured in Muslim hospitals all over the world. Uh, we've got to uh, break down what happened here. 
what we do know about Benghazi. Uh, it's basically been documented uh, under direct questioning by Senate Senator Kelly Iota, Republican New Hampshire. Panetta admitted that he had no communication with President Obama after their pre-scheduled meeting at 5 p.m. And the attack on the consulate had already been underway for 90 minutes at that time. Neither the president nor anyone else from the White House called afterwards to check what was happening. The commander-in-chief had, le- had left it up to us, said Panetta. That's unconstitutional. I mean, yeah. it's unbelievable that he gives so little concern When you've got something like this happening, now you and I know and the American people know that nothing happens in the world that doesn't get, that's important, that doesn't get relayed to the president in his ear wherever he is. You know that. Yeah. Oh, well, here's the, here's the other thing too. You know, no matter what, if, if we decide, okay, we're going to send troops, all right, Panetta was to decide. If Panetta were to decide, we're going to send troops in, you know, from Aviano or from wherever, and we're going to send in a strike force to pull these guys out, and they do so. You know, technically, that's an act of war. You're you're sending troops into a sovereign nation. And Leon and Panetta doesn't have the the. He does not have the authority no, uh-uh. to no. to pull the trigger. On. Short of a, an act of self defense, where a commander on the ground has to do something to save his life. Well, yeah. Uh, and and a, an offensive this, action doesn't happen unless the president says so. And whereas the, the, that's the position that the SEALs were in that were there, where the, the CIA guys, right. like the former SEALs, whatever you want to call them, that's the position they were in. They were in a defensive stance and a defensive posture, and they had to defend themselves. Sure. And, that's, and that's all in order authorized. For, the, for us to send any guys in there, for us to send in, you know, a, a SEAL Team 6 or a, you know, FAST Team or whatever. And they did send one FAST Team, and that's the way they got those 30 people out. Yeah, but they didn't send, they sent them. To, to uh, Tripoli. They sent them to Tripoli too, way too late. Yeah. Way, way too late. But because th- th- those poor ba- th- those poor guys, those poor SEALs fought for seven hours. And they're saying that. Seven- hours for in seven hours we could have sent troops from fort bragg and they were saying i mean panetta was up there and he was lying saying there was no way we could get people in there in time and this that and the other thing and i'm thinking you lying bastard i saw uh reports early on in the first few days of the or the first couple weeks after benghazi that they were saying from italy we could have spun up those gunships and we could have been there in an hour or however long, the, whatever the air distance is. But it's like, that's why we're here. And, and the thing is, when you're talking about an F-16, it's supersonic. It's, it's An F-16 running at Mach 3 will be there in a matter of, pff, what, maybe an hour? I maybe mean, an hour. I'm not even going to go there. I don't know. But I know they could have they could have had an effect on the outcome. And it was a deliberate decision to not do that. Absolutely. All you got to do is do a low-level flyby at Mach 1. And and the just the sound on an F sixteen coming through at Mach one. Yeah, it would have t- sent everybody well, home. T- yeah, that disperses the crowd immediately. Panetta and Dempsey also admitted under questioning by Senator Ted Cruz that they were not in touch with Secretary of State Hillary Clinton during the attacks and did not receive a request for help from the State Department. Dempsey also testified that he had been surprised at Clinton's testimony last month that she did not know of an urgent cable from Ambassador Stevens last August about the dire security situation. That uh, that has to be a lie, too. Oh, without a doubt. I, I mean, mean, and that's the thing. Hillary went in front of the House, in front of the Senate, in, well, in front of both, both Houses, lied through her teeth. Went to, got, When she got done, she... Now, if I'm you not, were if you were I'm a no staffer, a if you were a staffer, chief of staff or otherwise, whoever the highest ranking person is that got that message, who wouldn't go tell the boss that their people out in the field are asking for help? Didn't happen. I, well, here's the thing: I don't give a damn if, if if it you know if it was the sec you know the assistant to the the secretary or whatever. If it was the guy in the goddamn mailroom who gets that and goes, "Oh shit." The, the they're, secretary they're needs help. they well plus they they're going to tell her absolutely people people in a structured environment such as the United States government are going to tell the boss 
Because it goes in the chain of command. Absolutely. Oh. Absolutely. So that's, that's all bullshit. Panetta was also forced to admit in the face of vigorous questioning by Senator Lindsey Graham that no military action at all had been taken to intervene in Benghazi after the attack had begun, promising only that a similar lapse would not happen again. Now, I remember reporting on this program that there was a, a Marine Corps fast team that came in there and helped with the evacuation of the people that did get out. Yeah, next now, day. I guess that's not a military operation. No. I don't know. Sometimes it's Alice in Wonderland. Ward, we covered we covered Mr. Carson, an outstanding uh, gentleman. He had a hell of a whoop, he had a hell of a life story too. I mean, it was compelling. He had like oh yeah, he had like forty two brothers and sisters or something and lived in a shoebox. Yeah, poor guy. Yeah. You know, he, he grew up poor, and it, yeah, his story is phenomenal. I um, thought the one part that was that was really compelling to me is that his mother had a third grade education and would take their they used to have to read so many books in a week or whatever and provide a written book report to their mother. And their mother would go on it with a red pen and make checks and things like that. And they found out later in life that she didn't know how to read. Yeah, she had a third grade reading edge. Third, she read at a third grade yeah. level. I thought that was pretty good. I mean, this guy's a head of neurosurgery at John Hopkins. I mean, yeah, I mean, he's not a dumb cat to begin with. No. You know, he, but, you know, it's one of them cases where, you know, the fact that, that he's speaking, the, he's saying the same things we've said. And he's fearless. You know, I mean, he was standing right next to the president. But the thing was, he wasn't, that's the thing that nobody gets. He wasn't attacking him. No. You know, he was there. He said, this is, you know, do, do you understand what a trillion dollars is? Do you understand what a trillion anything is? And he tried to explain that. You know, he said, this debt is crippling, you know, and, and, and yeah. he, he put, I mean, it, it was so spot on. And when he finally came out and said, Hey, look, you know, the, they keep saying, how do we punish the rich guy? He said, well, why do you want to punish him? Right. No, it was why, very why, why does he need to be punished? That's the same, you know, and, and that's, I think, one of the reasons that, you know, there was a lot of people that said, oh, he should run for president. I don't think he should run for president. He's a doctor. He should be a doctor. Be, and he's a phenomenal doctor. You know, if you're the head of neurosurgery at John yeah. Hopkins, you're a pretty good, you know, you're a pretty smart guy. I think he should stick with that. And what he said, too, uh, along but with that is I that. I think that somebody should pick up the, you know, pick up the, you know, the flag. And say, okay, and champion the cause, because what he said rang true to a lot of people. And, and a lot of people said, hey, you know what, I can get behind this guy. But he's not a politician. He's, he, he's a doctor who was at the prayer breakfast, and he, and he made a speech. But he highlighted. And it was a phenomenal speech. He highlighted that, that, that the founders, out of the founding fathers, four or five of them were doctors. It, yeah, absolutely. And he basically said that doctors, the professional people need to get in this conversation and I think what he was doing was he was highlighting the fact that so many don't because of the political correctness. Then he said, that's got to stop. There's got to be the best, the best and brightest in our society have to run this country. Well, and, and I, I like the thing he said, too, about the, uh, about the, um, oh, about lawyers. He said, lawyers, you know, th that are all politicians, he says, what's the first thing that a lawyer's taught to do? Yeah, to win. <laughs> He's taught to win. At and it doesn't cost. matter if you're on the left or if you're on the right. And it doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. You still got to try to win. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, that, and that was the thing that he pointed out, which, I, like I said, I really did appreciate his speech. And, and, I and, too. I mean, he was, he was balls on. I have no problem with that. I I would really like to see somebody step up and and champion this, you know, and continue the conversation. Well, he's been on several uh, follow-up interviews, just not. Oh, absolutely. None he, of them he on became NBC. a rock star overnight. Uh, now, moving along here, because we're already not going to get to everything, uh, Cheney uh, had a speech, and he basically uh, was criticizing the, the caliber of the people that Obama is nominating for these important decisions or uh, positions. And he basically uh, said Hagel, a former Nebraska senator, was chosen because Obama wants to have a Republican that he can use to take the heat for what he plans to do to the Department of Defense. And he just goes down the line. And ladies and gentlemen, you can go to our show notes link page 
uh, because there's going to be a lot of this stuff that's uh, we're not going to be able to cover in depth. But he, uh, John Kerry, he said the same thing about it. John Kerry's just uh, not fit for this, man. I mean, it he was never was no. I, I don't think that that Kerry should have been in in the Senate at all. And the worst much... one, the worst. You're right. He shouldn't have been. I mean, the worst one to me was John Brennan. John Brennan, if they don't block anybody, they need to block that Muslim Brotherhood guy. I mean, he's straight up. He's he's he got to go. Yeah, you know. Well, I mean, and we we've talked on the show many times about Ron Paul, and, and every time we do, we get you know kind of hate mail and stuff. And I, you know what? To be honest with you, I don't give a damn anymore. That that either. guy is batshit fucking crazy. He is. I'm gonna say it point blank. And, and and bring on all comers because he did something that was so vile and, and, and disgusted me to a level that I've never, uh, that I very rarely go. It was after Chris Kyle was killed. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, Chris Kyle was the, the ex Navy SEAL who was the most deadly sniper in history. He earned a permanent place on the sidebar of steelcityresistance.wordpress.com. Thanks for putting that up there because I couldn't handle it. No problem. But after Chris Kyle died, uh, was killed, helping a guy with PT, uh, PTSD at a firing range, uh, Ron Paul posted this on on, um, on Twitter. Who, who live by the sword, die by the sword. Chris Kyle's death seems to con confirm he who lives by the sword dies by the sword, the tweet read. Treating PTSD at a firing range doesn't make sense. Man obviously knows nothing about what he's talking about. Uh, a lot of times uh, when somebody is suffering PTSD, it has to do with weapons and small arms and things. And what they're doing, because he's not the first one that ever did that, what they're doing is trying to get a lot of people in the military are hunters and are, are marksmen and for recreational purposes. And when you have somebody like that, in order to get them back into the mainstream, you're trying to show them the joys of, of guns again. You know, the, the good points that, you know, made up so much of their lives. Uh, Ron Paul doesn't know anything about that, though. Yeah, well, the the fact that, that he would... That it, he would say on on his Twitter feed anything like that about oh, yeah. uh, uh, about a hero, about about somebody who who went into combat on a you know on many occasions and, and was what do they call him the devil of Ramadi? Yeah, I mean this because, guy's got 160 bodies in his head, and you're going to say anything vile about him? That's I mean he did that so your kids didn't have to, Ron. You know, this guy's a hero, a, above reproach. That was one-on-one, -on -one, him on the enemy every time. And, I mean, being a sniper is not just shooting a rifle. Being a sniper is, is one of the hardest jobs in the military. Because the, you, you sit still for hours upon hours upon hours on end until you get your target. By your damn self, or maybe with one other guy. You might have a spotter if you're lucky. Right. Uh, anyway, uh, the next the next story involves Rand Paul, and the reason I'm saying this, and the reason I'm covering this, is because he said some things that uh, most politicians will not. Now, I will say, this is a, there's a transcript of the entire speech uh, on the uh, show notes page. He gets a lot of things wrong in this. His foreign policy is flawed, uh, but he starts out right. He he thinks that you can contain Islam, and that's just not not feasible or possible. Uh, but he does uh, get in there and talk about McCain's call for a 100-year occupation does capture some truth that the West is in for a long, irregular confrontation, not with terrorism, which is simply a tactic, but with radical Islam. As many are quick to note, the war is not with Islam, but with a radical element of Islam. The problem is that this element is no small minority, but a vibrant, often mainstream, vocal, and numerous minority. Whole countries such as Saudi Arabia adhere to at least certain radical concepts, such as the death penalty for blasphemy, conversion, or, or apostasy. A survey in Britain after the subway bombing showed 20% of the Muslim population in Britain 
approved of the violence. Some libertarians argue that Western occupation fans the flames of <coughs> excuse me of radical Islam. I agree, but I don't agree that absent Western occupation that radical Islam goes quietly into that good night. I don't agree with FDR's VP Henry Wallace that the Soviets or radical Islam in today's case can be discouraged by the glad hand and the winning smile. And it's six pages long, ladies and gentlemen, the speech. And he goes on to screw everything else up uh, in the in the speech. However, I think that just that identification of uh, radical Islam for what it is is a good start. Yeah, well, you did see the memo that came out, right? That uh, basically that basically says it's okay to use drones to kill uh, Americans. And I'm I'm torn on this. I, I I mean, deep down inside me, it's it's wrong. I mean, but then you look at what if they what if they find some the definition of American. All right, now you have these Islamic people that have in their doctrine that it is okay to lie as long as you're forwarding the gospel of Islam or whatever. So they come over here and they play the game. And they get citizenship. That's who we're talking about here when we're talking about killing Americans. But not necessarily. That's not necessarily. You... Like Al Alawi was born in the U.S. Okay, but he's and he Islam. converted to, to he converted to Islam. He, I mean, he was an American. Right. He converted to Islam and then went to Yemen. That's where they blew him up at. Fire. <laughs> you know. Yeah, but here's the problem. All right, it. it the the problem then becomes i mean and, and i'm gonna put on my tinfoil hat for a second what happens when they decide steel city resistance that's what it, that's why i'm against it because in order to be for it you have to trust the president i do not trust the president because well no i i think that in a case where you can uh you can apprehend the person and and you can you know go through due process you know, it's very similar to, to the, the what's his name, the, the raghead down at Fort Hood. Um, I forgot the, his name. He's still alive. Yeah, they got him. And, and I think that, you know, they're, they're trying to go through due process. And, and, and that's right. That's the right way to handle that. But I do I think mean, there's times. I think there's time. And, and now, I Al Lockley was a different animal. You know, I mean, he was he was an American, but he was on foreign soil and he was coordinating attacks against our military. I don't have an issue with that. Can we just but get a to, second signature on it or something? You know what I mean? Yeah, but to have that blanket, you know, statement that says, you know, any American citizen can be, you know, taken out with a drone, you know, if they're, you know, convicted of terrorism or if they're implicated in terrorism. So there's where your gray, your you know your gray area becomes. All it's right. Who, who who falls into that? And I have to make you know, sure I got to make sure when I'm thinking about this, that I want the same thing for Marco Rubio when he's president. You know what I mean? It's got to be balanced. It can't be political like it is with the Democrats. They're, you know, when when Bush was doing wiretaps, he was the the Antichrist. But now they want Obama to be able to kill people. You know, they go with the wind. And I just want to make sure that my position is the same, no matter who's the president. Well, I, you know, it, it's one of them cases where I totally believe that it, if he is a commander on foreign soil and he is uh, uh, actively uh, coordinating attacks against our troops, take him out. I don't have a problem. And I think it should be but run the by the, Depart the Department of Defense, too. I mean, I, I'm not so sure... You know, who's bringing him, it should be vetted before it gets to him. You know what I mean? Like, there should be a case made, like some general comes in the room and says, this guy in this video right here, he blew up this school, did this, did this, he's from Wyoming, what should we do? You know, should we take him out? To me, he's an enemy soldier, he's a traitor. If he is, if he's, if he is not on American soil, I'm all for it. If, he, if he's in Yemen and he's... No, if he's on American soil, you take his ass to jail. And we exactly. and we find out exactly everything that I no but no no just drones in America. The way that this thing is written, no, 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 Hutch. The way this thing's written, they can. If you're convicted of terrorism, or if you're implicated in terrorism, uh, 
they can take you out. And it doesn't, and there is no geography. It doesn't say, well, if you're in the U.S. or if you're in Canada or if you're in, no. It says any U.S. citizen who is implicated in uh, terrorism I, I, is fair game. I think they capture you. I don't think there's any, any case to be made for killing somebody in the United States. If you can find him and, and prove that he's a terrorist, fine. But go capture him. Let's find out what else he knows. You know, they haven't captured a freaking high-level uh, enemy combatant. They've captured one in his whole administration. He's used like four times more drone kills than Bush did. But Bush used to capture people and get information from them. Yeah, uh, we waterboarded him, and it was so bad. Oh, <laughs> did, did I put that in there? Uh, we don't, I don't know if we're going to have time to get to it. Yeah, uh, anyway, right. Panetta had to come out and admit. In oh, fact, yeah, yeah. Admitted that... Uh, Waterboard got the information. That waterboarding yeah. worked. That some... enhanced interrogation techniques worked in helping us cap or kill Osama bin Laden. And, and we the know fact it. that this administration and all the lefties and you know how bad you know waterboarding is and how bad you know et cetera et cetera et cetera. You know you don't get any actionable intel. We were able to get intel to kill the most wanted man on the planet. Yep, it worked. Now, uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to do a little speed move here and try to get through these last stories. Uh, I guess they caught a lady admitting that she voted a couple times for Obama, and there's like 19 possible cases of alleged voter fraud in Ohio. Who to, who to thunk, you know? Yeah. That was the biggest fraud around. These Democrats running around acting like there's no no voter fraud, no problem at all. Everything's good. Well, you what know, gets me is— A bunch of criminals. You know, a lot of these places, too, there were whole cities— that didn't, you know, that didn't have any votes for Romney. Exactly, and, precincts. And to not, me, that just doesn't make sense. It I was, mean, it was whole precincts, not whole cities. It was whole. whole okay, whole precincts. Yeah. whatever. But you'd still. Yeah, I agree. You have, no. you'd, you'd figure there's at least one guy that goes, you know what? Maybe, maybe we got to give the other guy a shot. Yeah. You know, one or at least one or two. There were entirely too many precincts that were all 100% yeah. Obama. That yeah. can never, and, ever and happen. And there was more. The law, big, the law of large numbers tells you that that can never happen. And the other side of that, there was more votes than there was registered voters. I mean, there was just all kinds of discrepancies. Uh, something I almost forgot. It's unbelievable to me. Hillary Clinton is the most popular politician on the political stage. That is embarrassing. That is a complete slap to the education system in the United States of America. That woman is a criminal. She is a dragon lady. And for her to be the most popular person in the political stage is disgusting to me. It, it says terrible things about our country. Well, don't you understand, Hutch? That's exactly what they're trying to do. Oh, now, I know. I know why. Now that, they, now that Obama's in his last term, he can't run again legally. So they're going to throw everything towards Hillary. Oh, so yeah. now Hillary's going to come out, and she's going to be this goddess who just did all of everything. She got right. away with murder in Benghazi, and I'm never going to forget that. Uh, she co helped cover up TWA Flight 800. I mean, she's just been horrible. Now, something that's going on that I enjoy, Karl Rove is getting smeared. He's been using language of the left, and he's been saying that he's going to, you know, uh, check candidates to make sure that they're electable, which basically just means he's going, he's trying to lessen the Tea Party effect, I believe, on American politics so his old cronies can, can line up. What do you think about Karl Rove? I think that, you know, he is old school, the, you know, one of the old school Republicans, and he doesn't know how to handle change. No, and and that's agree. exactly what's happening is you get these, the new guys that are coming up in the Republican party, the Marco Rubio's and um, who Carl you know, Rove was against. Who Carl and, Rove was against. Carl uh, Rove was against our Senator Pat Toomey. He was for Arlen Specter. And he was against uh, Alan West. Ted Cruz. Ted. Yeah. I mean, you look at, at anybody that, that's a rock star right now in the Republican Party, and that's who Karl Rove is against. Absolutely. Now, there is some light at the end of the tunnel here. Uh, I forgot to mention earlier that the State of the Union's coming up, and the Republicans selected Marco Rubio to give the uh, counter speech to that, and Rand Paul, 
who I think is excellent. I mean, he got his foreign policies ate up, but we can debate that later. We'd be much better off having him in there than what we got now. But he's given the Tea Party response. So that's uh, that, that's looking good. Yeah, that'll, that'll be interesting to see. The only other thing happening is, oh, uh, go ahead. Uh, now I'm going to let you have this one. This is your boy. Yeah, this uh, Jesse Jackson Jr. is finally getting a little bit of what he deserves. Now, I think he deserves much more than five years, and they got him for using uh, campaign funds uh, to buy Rolexes and, and, and things like that, furniture and whatnot. A real idiot here. And then he would try to act like he was sick. Uh, he's almost as bad as his father. But Jesse Jackson Jr. tried to buy a Senate, uh, U.S. Senate seat. To me, he ought to be doing 30 years. I mean, that's the usurpation of the United States government when you start buying seats like that. I mean, I know he's from Chicago and everything, but uh, we're cleaning the streets of another one of the Chicago criminals, ladies and gentlemen. Jesse Jackson signed a plea deal that gives him, I believe it's five years in prison. Yep. So that's good. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for letting us into your life for an hour. We got through every story. We cut some of them a little short, but uh, that's amazing. Uh, give us, send us an email. Uh, SCRTV at live.com. Uh, check out SCRTV on uh, Blip. Uh, you can also check it out. I think I'm going to try to build a, a separate YouTube page for Steel City Resistance so we can get that out a little bit more. What, what else is going on, Ward? You can always hit us up on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Steel City Resistance. Uh, send us an email, SCRTV, SCRTV at live.com. Go, um, go to website steelcityresistance.wordpress.com. Those all, all everything complements each other. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on everywhere. Please tell your friends about the program. Uh, we'd like to expand a little bit more. Facebook page uh, keeps growing, uh, a little slower now, but it's still still in positive movement. Uh, I don't know, Ward. You got anything else for the for the nation? No, sir. I am over and out. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll catch you next week. Thank you very much.